Hello, my name is Leah Tillman, and today I'm going to be interviewing Norman Lotstein uh, for the Veterans History Project uh, in cooperation with the Library of Congress. And uh, we are here in his beautiful house, and today's date is June 28th, uh, 2016. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, thank you for your willingness to be interviewed, and I know that you were in the Army and you uh, were in the Vietnam uh, War, uh, but I'd like to ask uh, some biographical details sure. first. Okay, could you tell us uh, where and when you were born? Born here in Stanford, Connecticut, November 11, 1941. And can you tell us a little bit about your parents? My Father was born in Stanford as well. My mother was born in Newtown, Connecticut, and uh, they uh, married and li lived in Stanford, uh, in not far from here, as a matter of fact. And where did their parents come from? Their parents, uh, my father's parents came from Romania. My mother's parents came from Austria. And was that at around the turn of the century? Just after the turn of the century, in the early. Uh, between around 1905, 1906. And do you know uh, what your grandparents did for a living? My grandfather was a peddler. He uh, sold uh, meat products and would travel between Stanford, New Canaan, Darien, Greenwich, and so forth. My, my mother's father was a farmer in Newtown, had a small farm that had cattle, chickens, and uh, raised vegetables. And was it like a barren to, I think it's the Rothschild farm? Do you know anything about that? No, no. Okay. This was barren to Busker farm. Okay. <laughs> and, what did, and what did your parents do? My father and his brothers were in the food business, and they had a wholesale and retail food business here in Stanford and in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Could you name it for for the Grand street? Central Markets. Were the markets here in uh, and where was Fairfield it? County had upwards of uh, twelve markets. Oh wow! Okay, and um, did you have any siblings? I have a brother and a sister, uh, both younger. Both uh, my brother lives here in Stanford, and my sister in Richfield, Connecticut. Um, what were you doing before you entered the service? I was in college. Okay, can you? I, I went to college, mm -hmm. I got an undergraduate degree, uh, a Bachelor of Arts degree, and uh, where I went, ROTC was a required course for men for at least the first two years, and then you could volunteer to go in for the second two years. And uh, my thinking at that time, for practical purposes, because of the war being what it was, and there was significant draft going on at that uh, the likelihood I was likely to go into the service, and if I had to go in, I would just as soon go in as an officer. So I opted to continue in ROTC. And what college and what year was that? It was uh, Cornell University, and I graduated from Liberal Arts College in 1959, uh, 1963, and the, I got a master's in business administration in 1965. Okay. Um, you've already told us that. Um, you enlisted, well, it's like you enlisted because Similar, you yes. continued yes. to ROTC. So yeah. when you graduated, you I, were in I, the Army. I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Army. Okay. And could you tell me um, what, why you, you, you just chose ROTC because it was the, I mean, the Army because it was there? Again, I, they, we had a choice between the Army, Navy, and the Air Force. Oh, you did have a choice. And the Navy and the Air Force was a three-year commitment, and the Army was a two-year commitment. And so, again, for my, my choice was to take the, the lesser time for uh, obligation. Okay. Um, what happened when you departed for your first training? Or was, well, did you well, have a first training because well, you were in ROTC? A couple stories related to that. I, um, everybody who graduated Army ROTC at Cornell was in, uh, put in artillery. 
And because, as I mentioned, my family was in the food business and it was my intention to join them after the service, mm -hmm. I went down to the Pentagon, told them that was my uh, objective, and could I get some food-related jobs in the Army. And they readily uh, encouraged me to get into the Quartermaster Corps, oh. which I did. Okay. And um, after graduate school, I wasn't scheduled to go into active duty until the following March. March uh, 18th, as a matter of fact. And what year? 1966. And in the interim, I got word that my best friend was about to get married on March 19th. And I was to be the best man. Oh, so I God. called the Army up, asked if I could be excused <laughs> that my second day, and they said absolutely yes. Oh, they really? Did. Really? And as a matter of fact, the Army was extraordinarily accommodating to me throughout my term there. And I can oh, tell you more about that. That is very interesting. Um, so, what was your early training like? I was, uh, my early training was at uh, Fort Lee, Virginia, mm -hmm. the, at a quartermaster training school. And I went down there with my, I was married at the time. And I was, went down there with my wife. And it was really just basic Army training. Uh, nothing uh, special, really, uh, other than... Did you, did you live with your wife on yes, base? Yes, yes. In uh, an army, uh, in the officers' quarters uh, that they provided. Can you recall any of your instructors? No. And what they were like? No, no. As a, my, my experience there and, and further along were really very positive. Uh, very good. The... You mentioned quartermaster training. Yes. What was that like? The, the training really was more basic military training in terms of uh, experiencing the various, you know, uh, rifle, uh, pistol shooting, uh, very basic things. It wasn't really that much dealing with quartermaster, quite frankly. Okay. How did you adapt to military life? It was not a big deal. It was really quite easy. Nothing uh, extraordinary. So you didn't find the physical. It was it was challenging, but the fact of the matter is, I was in my best physical condition ever while I was in the army. They uh, ran you a bit, and uh, it was fine. Uh, what was the food like? Food was contrary to the myth that we are all aware of. It was frankly very very good. So you, do you think it's because you were an officer? Uh, no. I'm, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, my first job in the Army following basic training was at Fort Lewis, Washington. Okay. And I was uh, uh, appointed to the general staff at the Army Training Center at Fort Lewis. The G4, that was the section that dealt with logistics mm -hmm. for the uh, training. And I was made the food advisor. And so I was responsible for feeding all the troops, thousands of troops, three meals a day. Oh, wow. At the base and off base at the training center. And while I can say when I got there, I knew the difference between a broccoli and a carrot. <laughs> I had the very good fortune of having an E-8 enlisted man assigned uh, uh, as my assistant who taught me the ropes. And uh, I can say from firsthand experience that food was very good in the Army. It was, it was very, you know, presentable, very tasteful, mm -hmm. and not at all what I had been led to believe was the case. What was your social life <clears throat> like at basic training? It well, wasn't a whole lot because we were pretty busy. <laughs> so there, I, there really wasn't much uh, social life, quite frankly. I, I made friends with uh, other fellows in my class one in particular was an attorney from Birmingham, Alabama, a gentleman by the name of Joe Stewart. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, maybe one weekend, I think, we went to Richmond, Virginia, just to visit that city. Uh, but it, it, we really didn't have a whole lot of time for socializing. Uh, did you have <coughs> any um, experiences with the Jewish community? No. During basic training? Not really. I mean, the Army always offered non-denominational services uh, for those who wanted to partake mm -hmm. in them. And I really, uh, really did not partake in any of those services. Um, <clears throat> what about where you were stationed in Washington? Washington, again, 
uh, it was the same situation where uh, you, you could get non uh, attend non-denominational services. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. Uh, I never really, to the best of my knowledge, uh, had any interaction with the Jewish community in the Tacoma area where Fort Lewis is located. Mm -hmm. Did you have any kind of, or did you feel you had? any kind of discrimination while you were at basic training or at the camps? I neither saw, heard of any type of discrimination, period, in my total military experience. Uh, that was one of the things I was particularly appreciative and proud of. I felt that uh, everybody was very respectful and appreciative of others. That's nice to hear. Um, we're going to talk about your wartime service now. Um, where did you serve? You mentioned this base, but where uh, else? I, well, I, I got orders to go to Vietnam. When I received the orders to go there, I contacted the Pentagon and asked for the names and addresses of the commanding generals mm -hmm. in Vietnam, and there were only six or seven of them. Oh. And I wrote to each of them, indicating that I was coming over there, and if they had any food-related jobs that I would be interested in, to please keep me in mind. And oh, I didn't know you could do something like you that. You can do pretty much anything if you uh, really want to. And, and uh, when I, I, while I didn't hear from any of them prior to my getting there, the second week after I got there, I was summoned to the commanding general of First Logistics Command, mm -hmm. who indicated that he had gotten the letter from me, oh. and he had an opening, and he ex described it to me and asked if I would like it, and I, as it turned out, I told who I, I was working with in his command in any case, and I said that I felt the job I already had, I was serving him in a better capacity and preferred to remain there, and he let me do that. So, um... So, I mean, that's an, an extraordinary example of the degree to which they will try to accommodate, uh, or at least certainly they did in my experience. Right. Uh, could you... Uh, for, for someone who doesn't know about Vietnam, yeah. where exactly were you stationed? I was in Saigon. Okay. And uh, I, again, I was uh, assigned to the 1st Logistical Command, which is was responsible for all the logistics of the war, oversaw the, all the logistics of the war. And again, I got a very, very interesting and challenging job over there. Um, do you have any memories of story you can tell us of some one of your experiences in Saigon. In what type? Of, what are we talking about here? <laughs> um, well, you weren't at the front lines, correct? I was not at the front lines, although I was there during the Tet Offensive when the whole country became a front line, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. and so yeah. what action did you see there? Pretty much everything. I mean, there was a major fighting going on literally where I lived, uh, you know, fighter jets bombing uh, that I could see right within our area, helicopter gunships firing, uh, and uh, a significant ground fighting. I never, I have to say, I had a staff job, and uh, I was most fortunate to uh, have that, and so my experience was most fortunate relative to the soldiers who had combat jobs. Um, um, if you, uh, since you weren't on the front lines, yes. what were your exact duties? Well, as I said, I had a very, very unusual job. I was assigned to a job um, that worked in between the U.S. Army and the United States Agency for International Development. The U.S. government had decided that uh, produce was an opportunity for Vietnam to develop that industry and to create export opportunities for after the war. And what they wanted to do was to foster the marketing, the packaging, development of that whole industry. And so my job was to buy produce off of the local economy mm -hmm encourage, as I say, the, the sorting, packaging, and so forth of this, and I was responsible for buying uh, 40 tons of produce a day for the Allied forces 
20 tons of which I bought myself, and 20 was bought by people who reported to me. And as I say, we worked on uh, getting the uh, uh, tonnage up so that after the war, this could be a meaningful uh, industry for the country of Vietnam. That, now that's very interesting also, and to your knowledge, did that happen? I'm not aware of produce coming to the United States, but one of the other opportunities that I had to do a study of was the seafood industry, because they correctly realized that that was also another export opportunity for Vietnam, and if you go to the markets nowadays, the fish markets, you'll see Vietnamese shrimp and other shrimp, types of seafood yes. in particular. The study that I did, though, determined that we couldn't really buy um, seafood without impacting the local prices. The, the seafood produced was so limited because of the war, it, it really had to be remaining for the uh, local population. In fact, my constraint in buying local produce was that I had someone who worked for me that went to the market every day to ensure to get prices of all the produce items and so that I could not buy anything that would be above the current market price. I had to ensure that I wasn't inflating it for the local population. Um, what kinds of friendships or camaraderie did you have while you were over Well, the there? interesting thing is I mentioned my friend Joe Stewart, who was a friend of mine in quartermaster training. Mm -hmm. And after quartermaster basic training, he went, I, I don't know exactly where, and I went to Fort Lewis, Washington. The next thing I knew, I'm in Vietnam, and I'm in this unit that has approximately 30 people in it, one of whom happens to be Joe Stewart. Oh, interesting. So uh, we, you know, maintained in, uh, our friendship while we were there, and they were, we were really the best of friends there. Um, I just want to go back for a minute uh, to um, any of the destruction or warfare that you mm -hmm. saw before we go on. Um, did you witness any um, aftermaths sure. of battles, etc.? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the quarters that I stayed in was in a section of Saigon, and as I mentioned to you, when that Tet Offensive uh, began, there was a significant fight right in our area, and literally the whole area across the street from me was destroyed uh, as a result of some combat that went on there. None of which, as I say, that I participated in, but... When you say destroyed, did it burn? It was, no, it was, was demolished, it yeah, out? yes. Um, how did you stay in touch with family and friends back home, or your wife? I wrote a letter to my wife every day, because I knew they were far more worried about me not knowing what was going on than I was there. So what I would do is, as I say, write a letter. In fact, what I would do is write uh, the, with the, four, the next day's uh, time, so just in case I couldn't get to a letter the next day, uh, she had something uh, coming in. And my wife happened to live with my parents while I was in Vietnam. Oh. She was teaching here in Stanford. Um, and I wrote to friends and uh, but, as well. But it was mostly it was writing, not telephone. Or... Well, you couldn't do telephone then. And so I had two opportunities while I was there to go to the USO. And I could call her, which we arranged via letter in mm -hmm. advance at a, at a particular time, and it was actually done by radio. And so I would say, uh, hi Nina, I love you, over. They would shut me down. Another person in the U.S., a radio operator would pick up and she'd say something to me and was instructed to end her sentence with over so that he knew to shut his radio down and turn mine back on to, to uh, continue the conversation. Uh, what did you do for recreation or when you were off duty? It uh, wasn't a whole lot. I mean, first of all, we were busy, we're fairly busy. I mean, I know occasionally we went, uh, maybe twice I can think of, that we went out to our, a restaurant in Saigon for a meal. But uh, the, uh, we may have had a day off each week and it was mainly just 
resting, quite frankly, and uh, relaxing a little bit. No movies, no USO shows. We had movies at uh, in our uh, barracks, actually, and I shouldn't say barracks. It was uh, it was really what happened to have been a hotel previously. Mm -hmm. Three of us shared two rooms, and where we uh, they had a dining on the upper floor and part of the area at the end uh, in the dining room. They put some movies on uh, periodically as well. Um, are you, um, did you participate in, t in any Jewish activities while you were in Vietnam? No. Uh, did you meet any Jews or local Jews no, in local Vietnam? Jews. I, I'm or? not aware of there being <laughs> local Jews there, but uh, I, I did. Uh, I, just had to ask, just so, in case, yes. because there's sure. Jewish populations sure. anywhere. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, one gentleman who was in my group, uh, my unit, mm -hmm. was Jewish, and uh, he was a friend of mine as well. Okay. Uh, where were you when the war ended? But I guess the I war came home. really didn't end. No, when I did came. You, when did you? When did you come home? I came home March of 1968, and uh, met. My wife, my parents, my in-laws, and some close friends at the airport uh, here in New York, and then came home. So you flew directly from Vietnam to New York? No, to California. Okay. Spent so the night in California. Us, yeah, tell us what the process was like. It was fairly simple. It was a, a, from Vietnam to California, where we uh, were, went through a medical exam and a, a debriefing as we were exiting the, uh, I was leaving the military active duty at that time. So I finished your two years. Yes. And uh, tell us a little bit about your homecoming. What was it like? We're pretty nice and pretty excited and pretty, as I said, we met at the airport and then uh, everybody came back to my parents' house where we had a little, uh, a small celebration. You know, obviously very, very happy to be home. Uh, how were you received by the community? Uh, there was nothing special uh, going on, with, uh, particularly with Viet Vietnam veterans there. It was, uh, for, for unfortunate reasons, they took up their unhappiness with war on the veterans, and I thought that was grossly misplaced, but nonetheless, that was the case. So there really was no conversations, uh, discussion about my experience with anyone. How did you readjust to civilian life? Yeah, and it was never a problem. And what did you start doing? As I had indicated earlier, I went into my family's uh, food business and uh, worked uh, with the uh, supermarket operation. Um, have you remained in contact with any of your fellow veterans? The, the one uh, person I've remained in mm -hmm. contact with is Joe Stewart, who uh, my wife Nina and I met in New York a number of years ago when he was up, and we communicate each year during the holiday time. We write each other letters. That's very nice. Um, are you a member of any veterans organizations? The uh, Jewish War Veterans here in Stanford. Okay. Um, how did your wartime experiences affect your life? I don't think there was any major impact, uh, quite frankly. I mean, I, what, the, the key thing I think I'd say, it gave me an opportunity to have some extraordinary responsibilities early on, which was very helpful to me in my work life uh, when I came home. Um, so you would consider that like a life lesson? No question. And um, anything about anything else? I think that you'd like to add uh, about what you learned by your experience. I, I've learned not to like war. I have to say that I am deeply annoyed by the hawks that we encounter in the world, and most particularly in the U.S. And I think it's easy for them to act this way when it's not their son or daughter that has to do go to the war that they're proposing. So my dream. And hope is that, frankly, that the U.S. forces ought to have some reasonable number of drafted people, always, 20, 25 percent, so that literally all of us here have, I would use the expression, skin in the game, 
you want to propose a war, keep in mind it could be one of your family that's going to uh, have to deal with it. Um, is there anything you feel that we haven't discussed that you might want to add to this? No, just to uh, reiterate that uh, my experience with the Army was very positive and I was most appreciative that it literally accommodated me in every possible reasonable way. And uh, you had no medical or, no. or any problems from your time in the Army? No, I was uh, As many, as I many was, Vietnam. Yes, no, I, be, I was most fortunate, as I say, having a staff job, not a combat job, and uh, as a result I was fine. Is there anything else you would like to add? I think that's it. Well, I want to thank you so much for volunteering. Okay. Um, we have a picture here of when you were in service. Yes. Could you tell us about that picture? This was taken, I believe, as I was leaving Vietnam at the Benoit Air Base area. And I remember when I first arrived in Vietnam, we arrived at Benoit, and when I got off the plane I thought, my God, this is what hell must feel like. It was hot as the blazes there. But I said, I must, obviously I have to get accustomed to this. Well, on my way out, I went through Benoit again, and it was just as hot going out as it had been coming in. But uh, it was a much happier experience. And what year was that? This was 1968. Um, thank you. Um, I would like to really thank you for volunteering to be interviewed by the Veterans History Project. And I'm sure that historians look, looking at uh, this data, because that's what it really is for research, um, will be very edifying to future generations. Well, Thank you. Happy to participate.